Hey, everybody. It's Rob Berger, host of the Door Roller Money Podcast. Hope you're having a great day. Today is January 25th, 2016. I've just survived Snowmageddon, Snowpocalypse here in Washington, D.C. 24 inches of snow. Uh, been lots and lots of fun. And I'm finally getting to this podcast. So today we've got a number of things we're going to cover. The first is I've got an interview with the folks from draftapp.com. It's a free application uh, that helps you evaluate your portfolio. I had a chance to talk with Brad and Jason from draftapp.com and uh, got, got that for you. About a 27-minute interview, and hopefully you'll you'll enjoy that. And you can check out uh, their, their application if you'd like to. So we'll get to that in just a minute. After that, I'm going to cover three emails from folks that the, the, the emails are on topics that are very different from one another, but they all, in some, I think, pretty interesting way, relate to one, one another. The first, uh, from a listener named Jeff, about financial freedom. The second is actually from a high school friend of mine. I haven't seen him in 30 years. His name is Terry, and that his email discusses or asks about, you know, how do you save for retirement when you find yourself, say, in your 50s, and you're just starting out in terms of uh, retirement savings? What do you do? And then the, the the third email, kind of the other extreme, from a, a listener named Kyle. He's 18. He wants to invest. He wants to know how to invest and ask me some specific questions, some very good questions. And so we're going to cover those three emails after the interview uh, with Brad and Jason. Brad and Jason, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having us, Rob. We're excited to be on. Well, I uh, am excited to have you on. I, I, li- I like new technology, and I like guys that – people that start new companies, uh, maybe in part because sometimes I don't think I have the, the courage to do it. And, but that's exactly what you guys have done. Obviously, I want to hear about Draft, uh, which is uh, your new investing app. But before we get to that, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about who you are? Why don't you start? I know, Brad, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, my background is actually as a financial advisor. I started my career off uh, working with a couple other advisors on a team at Morgan Stanley in Chicago. Um, we were, um, at, if you show success as a as financial advisor, you start getting a lot of calls from other financial advisor companies and institutions. Uh, so we were recruited to join uh, UBS's ultra high net worth office. Um, which is where I ended my financial advisor career and then moved over uh, to the technology side and started working for a company called Zephyr, uh, which does performance and risk analysis. So if you've ever sat down with an advisor uh, and they've, they've shown you a report that's more than a couple of pages in a big book, um, that report was most likely created with the Zephyr software. Um, and uh, started to, to realize that the, the software and the, the technological advancements that were, were happening were in the wrong hands. They were, they were only being used by the investment professionals and, and oftentimes not even by the, the retail investment professionals, but really the, uh, the, the larger investment groups, the institutional investment groups like pensions, uh, consultants, uh, things like that, and that there was an opportunity to, re- to put that technology in a simplified version into the hands of investors, uh, which is – before going in that direction, decided to go back to school and do a master's program at the University of Texas uh, inside of a program called uh, MSTC, Masters of Science and Technology Commercialization, uh, which is where I met Jason, who has a very different background, but one that uh, definitely complements my background. Okay. Well, before we get to Jason, I just have to ask you, you know, you, you gave us a lot of information there. You mentioned uh, ultra high net worth. That was the group you were in. So what exactly, what, what, what does one have to do to qualify for ultra high net worth? You know, just give us all a goal to shoot for. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the, the, at UBS, they defined ultra high net worth as focusing on clients that had uh, $10 million of investable, a- investable assets and up. Okay. 10 million. Wait. And uh, so that's what we'll all shoot for. Um, curious if someone were to, 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 and I know this is a bit off topic, but if someone were to use their services, someone with $10 million or more in investable assets, what kind of fees would they be paying? Well, so when you start to have that ultra high net worth, um, you really enter a, a different uh, group of, of investors where you start to have access to different types of investment products, like separately managed accounts instead of mutual funds. Um, and you start to have enough money and enough um, enough enough assets to have control over the fees that you're paying and to be able to negotiate those down. So um, our clients were typically paying uh, 60 basis points to, to a percent in fees that, that had that type of net worth. 
See, if I had ten million to invest, I would just keep it in Vanguard index funds. But that's another <laughs> topic, and I, I and I'd pay five basis points. Okay, uh, Jason. In many, well, in many clients probably should have. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Jason. So tell us about your background. Yeah, so I spent uh, prior to draft, I spent the the last two years uh, running the Dell for Entrepreneurs program. So people are familiar with Dell, uh, the the technology company here in Austin, Texas, and uh, we started a program there to help uh, get entrepreneurs and startups off the ground using Dell technology, and that's really what lit my entrepreneurial spirit. And so, um, and then I I joined the New Venture Creation Program at the University of Texas, uh, but I spent a lot of time. Uh, working with venture capitalists, startup communities, uh, and learning what it really took to get a new venture off the ground. Uh, and I was looking for a great partner with a, a great idea uh, that had a large market. And Brad and I hit it off really well. And we spent about uh, six months in the program doing a lot of market validation as a school project. So, so that helped de-risk our decisions to leave these really nice paying jobs to get paid nothing for a little while. <laughs> so, so when did you guys leave those nice paying jobs and form draft? What, what, what was that this year or earlier? Well, I think it was actually the, the week after we graduated. Uh, so it was just over a year ago. Okay. Yeah. So I want to get into draft, but before I do, Jason, since you worked with Dell, I'm in the market to buy a PC and I'm kind of ashamed to admit it since everything I have is Mac, but I, I may need a PC. Does Dell make the best? Yeah. Best PC. I'm going to stay away from that right now. Just like we don't make recommendations of uh, funds to buy, I'm not going to make a recommendation on the right piece of hardware. Okay, that doesn't sound good for <laughs> Dell. Okay, uh, so tell us about Draft. What what is it? Yeah, so so kind of going back to what we were talking about before, and the that the 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 consumer, the investor, really needed um, to have these types of tools in their hand. Um, but before we could could put it in their hands, we had to make it simple uh, because obviously today, you know, that investing is just so, has become so complex and so difficult to understand, understand things. And part of that simplicity uh, comes with making it easy to get started. So draft is an investment analysis tool um, that starts with allowing you to connect directly to your investment accounts. Um, you can, the best way to, to think about this is kind of like what Mint.com did uh, with your personal finance and allowing you to correct, connect directly to your bank accounts, wherever they may be. Uh, we use the same data aggregator that Mint did originally. It's a, it's a company called Yodely that, um, that has all, all the security and direct connections in place that allow our users to connect directly to their bank accounts or their investment accounts, wherever they may be. Um, and then unlike Mint.com, we focus more on the investment side of things instead of the, the cash coming in and out. Um, so we can see inside of an investment account to see that you have you know, mutual funds and ETFs, but the feed that we get from, from those groups is, is pretty basic. So we connect to a, a Morningstar database that has all the product information about those investments. We keep both of those up to date on a daily basis to help people understand what's actually going on inside of their investment accounts, wherever they may be, in a holistic, single location across performance, fees and asset allocation. Um, so, so Rob, the first thing you can do is you can, you can stop using spreadsheets to, to keep track of your investments. So everything's updated automatically uh, every day for you. So that, that's a big benefit for a lot of users right when they come on. Okay. So this is a smartphone app. Is that right? So we, we built it, it will be a, a smartphone app available in the app store in 2016, uh, but we started with a, a web app okay. so that users can access it from any device, whether it's a Mac, a Dell, um, a, an Android or an iPhone. So, so if a user signs up and it's free to sign up, it's free. Okay. They can then connect their accounts, whether it's at Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab or Scott trade, uh, could be a retirement account, could be a taxable account. And you guys sort of suck in all that data in terms of what they are invested in and how much. Am I, do I have it so far? That's, Correct. That's step one. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then w- once they do that, they can see uh, their account changes as the markets open each day. Um, but I take it it also shows them their asset allocation across all of their accounts? It does. It, it, 
and we give the user the ability to toggle on and off the different accounts. So if they um, if they have all their accounts toggled on, um, we can show them how they're diversified across all of the different um, categories that Morningstar covers. So um, a- um, equity, fixed income, and cash, but also large cap, mid cap, small cap, geographic regions, and even down to the sector level. Yeah. So, Rob, one of the things I've heard you mention before is whether or not you should own the same type of fund in, in multiple accounts. And you, you recommend that sometimes it does make sense if you're not if you need more exposure to a certain sector or uh, and and draft will allow you to really see that pretty easily so if you're looking at your retirement plan and how it's diversified across the different choices you've had but you know you need a little bit more uh, in terms of like an S&P 500 index fund uh, it'll allow you to actually see combining those accounts together how that uh, how that exposure looks Okay. And so does Draft uh, make any recommendations in terms of not specific investments, but in terms of asset allocation? Yeah, um, we make no recommendations. Um, it's more a, a, a data visualization tool so that people can finally see and understand these things for the first time. But getting, getting access to someone's account and telling them something new about their investment accounts was, was just a, a necessity for what Draft really does. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's become a very helpful thing for a lot of people because it's been so difficult to just see those things. Uh, but the, the real goal of Draft is to create a better uh, benchmark and a better comparison tool. And it's that comparison that allows them to understand if they need to do something different, which we refer to as as opportunities. And the way that we handle that is to say, once we have all this information um, and can can make sense of the investment portfolio, we use the percent equity in someone's holistic portfolio combined with a risk statistic, standard deviation, and we we backtest these these portfolios of what they own today. And we show them, here's how you've performed over the last five years or 10 years inside of this portfolio. And here's the amount of risk that you've been taking. And we use those two numbers together, equity and standard deviation, to show somebody if they currently have a conservative, moderate, or aggressive portfolio, which is a new piece of information for a lot of of users. Um, But we do this because so that we can create that better comparison, that better benchmark. So if someone learns that they have a moderate portfolio, instead of comparing their diversified model or moderate portfolio versus the S&P 500, which is just you know, 500 big companies in the U.S., which is not a great benchmark, and it's, I think it's kind of silly that financial advisors continue to, to preach good diversification but then compare your portfolio versus 500 big companies in the U.S. So what we've done is created a better benchmark through crowdsourced data, so all the other users in our systems, even even professional strategies that we put into the platform, um, go into our crowdsource model to say, here's how your performance fees and asset allocation compare against the top performers inside of your category. So then the user has new data points to see that they've underperformed potentially, they're paying more in fees, or maybe they have asset allocation gaps versus that new comparison group. And where do you get the data? I mean, like, do you have... I know you mentioned you were sort of – I think you said you were sort of a financial planner. Correct. Yeah. So – but wh- where do you get the data to determine what, what would be considered moderate versus aggressive versus conservative? So um, the, the performance and risk analysis company that I, I previously worked with, Zephyr, has some of the smartest – minds in the, in the world uh, when it comes to this type of thing. And uh, we are lucky. And one of those, actually, uh, those the guys actually um, worked with Bill Sharp um, that, that created the Sharp Ratio. Uh, we were, Zephyr was the first to, to create this uh, analytics tool using returns-based style analysis and really pioneered a lot of the investment statistics that are being used by retail and institutional investment advisors out there still today. And we're lucky enough to have two of those individuals um, as part of our advisory board um, that really that help us to, to figure out what these, these, these proprietary algorithms are going to look like. Okay. So how do so as a business, you know, how do you make money with this? Because you know, to keep this going, you got to have revenue at some point. How are you going to make money? Uh, you know, the bottom line comes is is we make money when somebody makes a better long term financial decision. That's that's what it comes down to. So so on when we look at the draft application, we want people to uh, just basically get an analysis of their holistic portfolio. And then if we identify gaps in those portfolios, we can work with <clears throat> online partners like a TD Ameritrade to help them go open up a low fee, zero commission ETF account uh, at TD Ameritrade. Uh, because of the data that we have too, uh, somebody's 
personal financial situation is more than just investments. So we have a lot of adjacent industries that we can work with uh, for targeted referrals for people that say uh, need a new life insurance policy or an estate plan. And so we're, we're forming partnerships with those companies right now um, to be a, a big piece of our, our, of our revenue model going forward. Okay. So, so you could refer someone to a TD Ameritrade or some other um, service and you'd get a referral fee. Right. And it's, it's important to note, too, we uh, never refer a product. Uh, so we're not based on product referrals. It, it's always going to be a, an account uh, like a TD Ameritrade that, that shares in our vision of a low-fee uh, ETF. So how do you compete? So, you know, there are a number of companies that do similar things to what you're doing. Personal Capital has a financial dashboard. Future Advisors, you know, you can plug in your... Um, you, you can connect all your accounts, and it gives you their assessment of, you know, your asset allocation, what you should invest in. Sigfig has one. Um, Bloom with three O's has <laughs> one, uh, and I've interviewed uh, folks from there. Um, I think they're just focused on four hundred one ks, but they have sort of a similar thing. And I'm sure there are others. Those are just ones that come to mind. How does draft fit into that competitive landscape? Yeah, I think um, if you were to to simplify the the, the robo advisors that are out there today, um, you can really put them into two different groups. You can there are those that are free dashboard driven, like the personal capitals and the sig figs, whose whose uh, model is built around showing you something new about your investment portfolio that you couldn't have figured out before, and then using that information to lead you towards their online low fee diversified strategy. Um, and then you've got the the kind of uh, Questionnaire or Mad Lib style um, guys like the Wealth Fronts or the the Betterments uh, uh, that that you know understand something about you through a handful of questions and say it sounds like you're a moderate investor. Here's a good low fee, mo- diversified, moderate portfolio for you, um, and we'll keep this rebalanced for you. First off, it's it's an ama- it's a great addition to the investment industry. Both both of those groups, um, and we are, are different in that we are free dashboard driven. Um, but that, that information, that new information that we want to tell people, we want to take it a step further instead of just showing them, here's what you have in this account versus this account. Here's what your, you know, performance has been or your, or your dividends have been is that that's helpful. But what's more helpful is to compare it to something new. Um, and that's in a, in a, a, very, a real helpful, uh, benchmark. And that's, I think where, where draft really stands apart from the, the services that are out there now is that it, it educates you a little bit more about what you are today, you know, as far as a conservative, moderate, aggressive investor, and then gives you that, that new comparison data set so that you can make decisions on your own um, through a self-directed you know, online discount broker strategy or even use that information to hold your financial advisor accountable. Yeah, and, and draft can always, too, link up to a Wealthfront account and, and see how that wealth front account uh, is part of your holistic portfolio. So your wealth front account with your 401k uh, and with wealth front, you don't really have a lot of control over the decisions that you're making from an investment standpoint, but you may have outside accounts that you do have control. Now you can see those accounts all together uh, and fill those gaps with the accounts that you do have control over. Right, right. And, and Brad, you mentioned the comparison and I want to make sure that those listening understand that and that I understand it. When you when you put in when you connect your accounts and you see your asset allocation, you see your fees. Uh, you said there's a comparison element. What exactly are you comparing your portfolio to? Other users of Draft or something else? So I think the best way of, of explaining this is to to first start with what is in the platform right now. There there's just over a thousand. Uh, portfolios that are in the system right now. Um, some of these are from early users. Others of those have come from uh, manually going out to Vanguard, uh, UBS, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, Betterment, uh, Personal Capital, and finding out what they recommend as a conservative, moderate, aggressive portfolio. It even includes already diversified mutual fund products like target date funds. Um, and those have been uh, entered into the system um, Using that more, and then using that Morningstar data, we have characteristics of of those portfolios. We have their historical returns. We have what they're charging in fees for those. We have how they're diversified across those different asset classes. And 
every whether they're they're users in our system, which go into the crowd comparison, totally anonymous, by the way, um, or if it's one of these professional portfolios that we've manually loaded, loaded into the system, they all go through the same filter of is this conservative, moderate, or aggressive portfolio based on our proprietary algorithm. Um, of those thousand portfolios, two hundred and eighty of those were classified as aggressive. So then we say of these two hundred and eighty aggressive portfolios. Let's look at the top 10% of aggressive portfolios using their long-term performance history. Now we're going to take those 28 portfolios and aggregate the characteristics of those portfolio to aggregate, to just come up with a single return history, to come up with an average annual fee, and to show how they're diversified um, across different asset classes. And if you'd like, I can tell you a little bit about what those characteristics look like. Sure, why not? Oh, you mentioned equity and standard deviation. So, I, but yeah, why don't you give us some insight into that? Yeah. So, so the the definition of what, what those those aggressive portfolios is based off of the equity and standard deviation. And now, in this side by side comparison, a new user they come in, they see that they're aggressive. They can see how their historical performance, their fees, and their asset allocation compared to those por- those portfolios that have done really well. Um, and what we have found is that the, the top performers and the more data that we put into the system, the more and more it's just confirming these, <laughs> these things that we know about top performing portfolios over long periods of time. The historical performance over the last 10 years has been around 8.7% on an annualized basis. The average fees is, is around half a percent and it's really well diversified across um, the different categories, similar to what you'd see in type of, in, inside of like a, a modern portfolio theory type type allocation. Okay. So for those high performing portfolios, how much of their um, investments are in equities versus fixed income? Well, it, it depends on um, if they're conservative, moderate, aggressive. Yeah, for the aggressive. For the aggressives, it's, it's coming out around uh, just over 80%. Oh, in okay. Um, I was helping someone with a retirement account and they were looking at Vanguard's target date 2055 uh, fund, which is actually 90% in equities, which surprised me a little bit, but so just over 80. Uh, How far back does the historical data go? Uh, We take it back 10 years and we've, we've built some pretty uh, fancy additions to the system to make sure that every portfolio goes back 10 years. Um, Even if they have a mutual fund that only has a track record of two years, we use Morningstar data in a, in kind of a clever way to say, um, if only two years worth of data, what Morningstar category is this mutual fund in? And then go and stitch together that missing eight years worth of data using the Morningstar category average. Do you have plans to take the data back further than 10 years, or does that get complicated? Um, we always can, um, but it's the, the further it, – when you start going beyond 10 years, you start having to stitch together a lot, of, a lot more information that's not really true to what the person is holding. Right. So when you look at the historical data, you're sort of taking their current portfolio and assuming they held it without change for 10 years. Correct. Right. Which is an important assumption because, you know, as you know, so many people end up selling at the wrong time or buying at the wrong time or whatever. Right. Absolutely. And then the performance reporting going forward will be more accurate based on on what, what they buy and sell because we will have a daily access to those those buys and sell. So what are your future plans for draft? Um, get it in the hands of millions of investors okay. and help them understand uh, their investments and make better decisions using this new data. Um, we also, um, go ahead. Look, I was, was going to say, it, it, to add on to getting it in the hands of millions of, of investors, uh, we're exploring different channels. Uh, how can we get this into the most people the quickest? And who are the people that are going to benefit the most from this new levels of transparency uh, that the industry struggles with. So uh, we're open to new ideas. Uh, you'll probably hear about some of these uh, pretty pretty soon. Uh, but right now we're focused on getting uh, this in the hands of as many users as possible. So here's what you do. You get Vanguard to offer it to all of its clients. Yep. <laughs> they, just, they just need to pay you a tiny, 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 tiny fraction uh, per user that you both can go buy islands somewhere yep, exactly. and you've got three trillion under management using draft your draft app so i know you're a big supporter of vanguard so if you, you have any sway in there <laughs> i have none <laughs> we're, we're, those those are groups of people that that we're talking with you know people that share the same philosophy and the same belief that we do in in this low fee passive investment strategy yeah. It surprises me how, in my view, behind companies like Vanguard and Fidelity and the big mutual fund companies are with technology. 
Uh, you know, Schwab tried their own robo advisor service, which I'm not I'm not a fan of, but that's another topic. Uh, but but I applaud their effort, and maybe it's working out well for them. Uh, I, I maybe the company, maybe if you're Vanguard, you're like, look, I've got three trillion under management, and all of the robo advisors use our funds anyway, so we don't need to we don't need to spend the money to get into the yeah. technology. But even something like what you guys have developed, I don't understand why mutual fund companies wouldn't use that kind of technology. Well, I, I can tell you a, a personal story, and they're looking at. I just got back from uh, New York uh, last night, where uh, it was a technology a group of large banks and wealth management groups, uh, all the names that you know out there in the industry, and they brought in thirteen different startups, us being one of them, to hear where the industry is going and what technologies they should be looking at. And it was really refreshing for them because their their attitude was, hey, we, we need to look at cooperating uh, with these uh, startups and new technologies versus trying to necessarily compete with them. So it was refreshing to be at that conference and see that uh, some of these big banks and brokerage uh, companies are looking at these new technologies. Well, see, the cynical side of me says that some of these companies actually don't want this kind of technology because – it underscores the importance of fees, and uh, you know the reality is some household names, and I won't name companies at this point, but some household names uh, that have you know uh, mutual fund arms and they sell investment products charge an arm and a leg. Yeah, and uh, what they're realizing, though, too, is the new generation that's coming about, the millennial generation. They know that they're struggling attracting that generation, and the smart companies are knowing that they're having to change the way they market and the way they they attract uh, this new generation and, and the amount of wealth that's about to transfer to the millennial generation. Right, right. Well, go ahead. Sorry, I. uh, but uh, we actually have a a great personal story about – um, about Vanguard it, it, from one of our earlier early users, if you're interested. Sure, yeah. go ahead. That'd be great. Uh, um, and I think the best way of explaining the the Vanguard story is to um, to, sh- to tell it side by side with a with another early user. Um, both of these early users are females in their early 30s. Um, neither of them really had any idea what was going inside of their investment accounts. Um, one user um, is an attorney. And when she started making money, um, she asked her parents what she should do. They said, you should work with our our guy at UBS. We've been working with him for a long time. Um, So she did. And since she started putting money in that account, she just trusted that it was going up, um, you know, and that the guy was good. She had no idea what she was paying in fees. Another early user asked her parents the same thing when she started contributing to her 401k. And they said, just put it in the lowest fee options and make sure you diversify it over several different options. Um, The attorney found out after connecting her UBS accounts that she was aggressive, that she had underperformed substantially the top performing aggressives, and that she was paying 2.6% a year in fees. Um, she thought she was paying $40 a year in fees. Um, and that was probably a good reason why she was underperforming so significantly. The, the, the girl using Vanguard found out that she was a top performer, that she was well diversified and she was paying 0.2% in fees. She, she screamed with excitement. She was so happy that she was doing something, uh, she, she was doing the right thing and she's comfortable with her strategy going forward. The attorney, um, not so happy, um, got, actually got pretty emotional when she saw that the top performers were only paying half a percent and she immediately uh, fired her financial advisor and moved over to a well-balanced ETF strategy and feels much better about what she's doing now. Well, that's a great story and good for her. It still amazes me that there are service there are firms out there that would charge 2.6 percent but the reality is i know investment advisors nicest men and women in the world you just love to have dinner with them and they're going to charge you one and a half or two percent and they've got tens of millions of dollars uh or sometimes more under management and i just scratch my head like i don't get it but in any event that's a great story um hope to, hope you have more of those with some of your users as they uh um start to use your app well I wish you guys the best. I think this is uh, this kind of uh, app is great for retail investors. Every you know the regular folks who are trying to uh, make the most of their money. So I wish you all the best. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we're excited. So if folks want to f- check you out, they go to Draft App. That's DraftApp dot com. Is that right? That's correct. Great. All right, fellas. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for your time. 
So again, a big thank you to Brad and Jason for taking the time to come on the show. You can check out uh, their website and their uh, financial app at draftapp.com. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, perhaps it can help you evaluate your own investments. And if you do give it a try, I'd love to hear what you think about it. Shoot me an email, dr.doroller.net. Okay, uh, on to these three emails that I, I mentioned at the top of the show that are seemingly uh, unrelated to one another, very different topics, but I think actually tie together kind of nicely. So I want to go through them, talk about a couple of different things as we do. The first one comes from Jeff. He's a cardiologist. For some reason, I, I get a lot of email from doctors, and uh, Jeff is one of them. And he wrote in, he said, I very much appreciate when you write or podcast about financial freedom and living a life that matters and how finances and other things factor into that. I feel like much of the personal finance blogosphere is related to coupons and or frugality or getting out of debt, and much of it's focused on investing. And then there's the extreme early retirement crowd. I appreciate when you discuss setting goals for life and defining why it matters and then ultimately crafting a life, much like yours is turning out, where you maybe aren't 30 and retired and aren't currently struggling with debt and maybe aren't mega wealthy, but still trying to live a life of value where you currently are. I recently heard a quote that went something like this, don't aim for retirement, create a life now that you would never want to retire or deviate from. It sounds like that is what you are doing. Congratulations. Again, all the best, Jeff. He actually emailed me later to say that quote came from Seth Godin. Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a great quote. And uh, by the way, he had a PS that said that mentioned National Community Church, which is a church here lo locally in Washington, D.C., and Ebenezer, Ebenezer's Coffee House. Well, well, Jeff, he'd asked me if I'd ever attended National Community Church. I actually have. My wife and I went there one time. I actually enjoyed it. Uh, the, the pastor there, Mark uh, Batterson, is, it was terrific. Their churches are in several locations. They all meet in, in movie theaters. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm showing my age. I just couldn't wrap my mind around. I love going to the movies, but I just couldn't wrap my mind around going to church in a movie theater. But uh, it certainly enjoyed the service. Ebenezer's Coffee House, if you ever come to D.C. and, you know, uh, as a tourist or whatever, maybe you live in this area, it's a great coffee house. I've only been there once in part because of its location. It's located basically oh, a quarter mile from Union Station, which is a, a, a beautiful building itself worth seeing if you've never been. Uh, train station in D.C. I go there, of course, to get on the Excella to head up to New York City from time to time, uh, Amtrak. But uh, it's it's near Union Station. It's a wonderful coffee uh, shop, I guess, in the Capitol Hill area, you'd say. It's actually, you could, hit, you could take a stone and hit the, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission's headquarters from Ebenezer's Coffee House. Uh, and uh, so a great place to, to get a cup of coffee if you're uh, in the area, but I have been there. So, all right, so back to sort of Jeff's main topic, and it really it really resonated with me because I kind of view uh, doorroller.net, the blog, this podcast, as focused on financial freedom. Now, at, at various times, you know, we'll talk about a lot of the things that Jeff mentioned in his email. You know, we'll talk about getting out of debt. Why? Because I think it helps you achieve financial freedom. We'll talk about the extreme early retirement crowd like Mr. Money Mustache. Why? Because that's one way, not the only way, but one way to think of uh, financial freedom. We don't talk a whole lot about frugality, at least not in sort of the extreme sense, largely because that's just not who I am. I'm not, you know, I'm not a, uh, I guess in some ways I'm frugal, but I'm not uh, to the extreme. And that's just my personality. I, you know, I never have been. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of struggling with that as I think about what car I'm going to buy next. You know, how much am I going to spend? I currently drive an 11-year-old Honda Odyssey with about 200,000 miles, so it's it's slowly dying. It's been a great car. And so I think, you know, do I want to go sort of the frugal route or do I want to maybe spend a little more money and get sort of a luxury car? I don't know yet, but I'm not really a frugal uh, or at least extreme frugality. is not my thing. By the way, great if it's your thing because that can certainly help you achieve financial freedom as well. Uh, which I guess tells us there's more than one way to do this. But everything that I that I talk about on the show or write about on my blog, I, I try to think about it in terms of uh, achieving financial freedom. And you know, as he mentioned, this extreme early retirement crowd, and it's interesting because Mr. Money Mustache, if you follow his site, look at his comments, his forum, you'll see that there's actually a, a lot of folks level some criticisms at him. And they say, you know, this works for you because of, of, of your life choices and the way you like to live life. You know, you don't like to go to Disney World. 
That's not your idea of a fun vacation. And your hobbies and the things that you like to do aren't very expensive. You like camping out, for example, and riding your bike. Well, that's great. But what about the folks who like, say, more expensive hobbies, right? Or a more expensive lifestyle it doesn't work. And I think those criticisms are, are, are misguided because, you know, in the case of Mr. Money Mustache, he lives on, I believe, about $25,000 a year. Now, that's a choice that he's made. Uh, it's, it's not one that I would make, right? If someone said, hey, Rob, you can retire at 30, uh, you'll live on $25,000 a, a year, uh, what do you say? I'd say, yeah, no thanks, but no thanks. I'm much like kind of the way Jeff described it, is rather than retiring, finding something, work that I love and, 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 and doing it the rest of my life. Now, in my case, it's not just about what I'm doing, but it's also about where I'm doing it, how I'm doing it. For example, if someone said, hey, you want to come to work for our company and you'll be our blogger, you'll blog for us and, you, hey, maybe you'll even create a podcast. And, you know, you'll work nine to five and, you know, and you'll answer to a, a supervisor, but you'll be the blogger and the podcaster, basically what you're doing now. That would not appeal to me. It's just not what I want to do. It's not just about what you do, but it's the, the context. And for me, part of what makes what I do so enjoyable is that it, I'm the boss and I can sit here in my home and my office and record this podcast, uh, write a blog post, write for Forbes, whatever, on my own time, wherever I want, whenever I want. That's a big part of it. And so I've sort of crafted that lifestyle. Uh, but one thing that's allowed me to do it is that my wife and I have achieved a certain level of, of financial freedom. But where I think people uh, that maybe criticize Mr. Money Mustache and, and focus too heavily on his lifestyle is they miss the bigger point. Because you know Mr. Money Mustache, he's not trying to dictate to anyone how they live their life. What he's trying to show, though, is that with some smart uh, spending decisions and, and, and whatnot, you can create a, a life of financial freedom and even a, a life of early retirement if you want. You may not retire at 30 like he does. Maybe you retire at 40 or 50. Well, as I thought about that, you know, there's a really good application of what Mr. Money Mustache teaches for someone who, far from retiring at 30 or even retiring early, is struggling just to retire at age 65 or 70. And that actually brings me to the second email. I told you these were related. The second one was from a friend of mine, uh, actually a friend from high school. I haven't seen him in 30 years. Uh, his name is Terry, and he sent me an email uh, asking me some questions uh, about dealing with retirement when you've, you've not really prepared as well as you, you'd hoped to. So he wrote me and said, you know, he's 50, Hasn't really saved much for retirement. He's got a good job, a family, you know, but for a lot of different reasons, he really hasn't saved anything for retirement. So he's, you know, my age, I think he was a year ahead of me, and he's kind of starting from scratch on retirement. And he asked me, well, you know, what should I do? And um, I, I, I offered six suggestions. By the way, he hasn't responded to my email, so I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what he thought of my suggestions. Don't know if he listens to this podcast either, but I want to share those with you. But before we get into the details, from a bigger picture, if you think about what Mr. Money Mustache and the other early retirement crowd folks have done, they have retired in 10 to 20 years, right? And they've all retired early, 30 to 40 roughly is, is, is what, you, what you see a lot. You can take what they've done, model it, and apply it to your own life. If, say, you're 50 and haven't saved it all for retirement, you've got 15 to 20 years uh, to save, you can affect take what they did from the ages of say twenty to forty, and you'll just you'll just do the same thing from ages fifty to sixty five or fifty to to seventy. The point is, you can take what what they've done, learn from it, model what they've done, and apply it in, in, to your own life. Obviously, it's a very different set of circumstances. You're going to retire at I guess the tra a traditional age, maybe even a little later, uh, but you're going to retire. And, you know, if you're 50 and you're just starting out uh, in terms of saving, maybe you've gone through a divorce, maybe you've had health issues, maybe you just hadn't started saving like my friend. And, um, you know, you're feeling a little stressed and maybe some regret and, and all of that. Well, okay, you are where you are. We can't change that. But we can take a lot of, of what we can learn from folks like Mr. Money Mustache, apply it to your situation, and hopefully put you on the right track to, to, to retirement at some point in the not-too-distant future. So what does that look like? Well, I suggested six things to my friend, and I just kind of want to run down the list here um, somewhat quickly. The first one was you got to become a super saver. You know, you can't fight math. Math is math. And if you're starting at zero, you know, how much you have when you're, say, 65, if you're starting at 50, is going to depend on you know, how much you save, 
uh, and for those 15 years and what your return, your after fee, after tax return is. That's it. It's, it's just, it's math. You can't, you can't fight the math. And one of those ingredients is, and a big, a big one is how much you save. And so, you know, I think everyone should become a super saver. This is something I'm trying to teach my, my kids. And one of the things we require when they're living at home uh, or when they're at school on our dime is they save 50% of their gross income. You don't have any bills, uh, you're not going to be blowing all your money. You got to save fifty percent of your income. Frankly, we should probably m- require them to save more than that, since they don't pay. For, you know, they don't have they don't have rent. They don't pay for health care. They're not making a car payment. But uh, you know, we're trying to teach that at, at a young age. If you're fifty or thereabouts, and you're really struggling, but you're behind on retirement savings, you absolutely have to become a super saver. What does that mean? To me, it means at a minimum saving twenty percent of your gross income. Now. Some of you listening are going to say, well, that's easy. I say 40% or 50%. Uh, some of you are saying the exact opposite. That's impossible. I can't do it. This is ridiculous. And those folks have probably already turned off the podcast. Well, you know, there's a couple, I think, two ways really to think about saving. Um, one is from the top down and one is bottom up. Top down is, you know, again, set a percentage of your gross income, save it first and spend the rest. So save 20% and spend the rest. And uh, that, that's actually the approach that I, I prefer. I automate my savings, whether it goes to a 401k, an IRA, or a taxable account. I get it, I get it out of my checking account quick. Uh, it's out of, out of sight, out of mind. It's gone. And then I figure out, okay, how can I live uh, on the rest? I think that's probably the best approach. Some folks, though, you know, are going to be struggling with that. Yeah, I, I understand why I need to save. And 20%, I get it. That makes sense. Maybe more if I can. But I just don't, I don't see how I can do that. I'll, you know, I won't be able to pay the rent or the mortgage or, or whatever. And and for those folks, you really got to take a bottom up approach. You've really got to just go down your budget and look at at how you're spending your money, um, you know, item by item by item. And here's where, you know, when I talk to people, some of the questions I ask them, you know, do you have cable TV? Do you have a smartphone? What kind of vacations do you take? What kind of car do you drive? How many cars do you have? And you can see them immediately start to get all, mm, I don't like where this conversation's going. You don't want me to get rid of cable TV, do you? And I always say to them, I'm very honest, say, no, I don't care what you get rid of. Don't get rid of anything, right? But but you have to understand you, you're, you're in a difficult situation and you're going to have to make some tough choices. And so one of the things you're going to have to ask is, do I want to spend $150 on cable TV or do I want to put that money in the bank to save for retirement? Choice is yours. I'm not, you know, you do whatever you want. Same thing with a smartphone. Uh, you know, you want to buy an expensive iPhone, uh, or do you want to take, you know, buy, buy a less expensive option and, and put that money towards retirement? You really have to take it item by item by item. And is it fun? No, it's not fun. And uh, you know, some people get very defensive about it. And 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 you know, what well, do you have an iPhone? Do you have cable TV? I, yeah, I do. But I've also saved for retirement the last twenty five years. And uh, my situation is different than your situation. And my situation is, you know. Not going to help you one way or another. You've got to make these decisions on your own. But I think if you're if you're 50 and you haven't started saving for retirement, you're going to have to make some really tough decisions, and you need to make them now. And you need to become a super saver, and do everything in your power to make that happen. Is it easy? No, but it's something that you know it's got to be done, or you you know you'll be 65 and in the same situation. So that was the first thing I, I said. Become a super saver. To me, that means at least sa- saving at least 20 percent of your gross gross, gross income. The second thing is that I mentioned is you absolutely got to take full advantage of retirement accounts because of the tax advantages, whether it's a 401k or an IRA, traditional or Roth. You know, you can look at those questions. Those are important questions, but but you have to take advantage of the tax adva- the tax advantages that these types of accounts offer, and that's particularly true if your employer offers a 401k match. You absolutely you got to contribute enough to the 401k to take full advantage of that match. It's it's critical. And uh, so that was the second thing I said. Third thing I said, and this is going to surprise nobody, you got to keep your investing fees uh, low. I would, you know, I would suggest an index, you know, portfolio of index funds. I wouldn't necessarily suggest an extreme asset allocation of say 100% stocks, particularly for folks that are 50 and have never saved before. Uh, my concern would be that they're not going to stick to that plan. Now, you know, frankly, an, an 80% equity, 20% bond fund is still going to have the potential to lose a lot of money in the short term. So, you know, it may not be much easier to stick to an 80-20 allocation as it would a 100% allocation. And I do think 
you need to have a, an allocation that tilts heavily towards equity. You know, I probably wouldn't go much lower than 70-30. And that's true, by the way, generally, uh, not just for someone, say, 50, who's uh, just starting to save. Uh, but whatever your allocation ends up being, you got to keep your investing fees low. You, you know, I don't think anyone can afford to spend a ton on investment fees, but that's certainly true of someone who's 50. If you're if you're paying someone one or one and a half percent to invest your money for you, and they're putting you in in funds that are costing you one and one and a half percent, those fees are just going to eat away at, at your returns, and you just you just can't afford it. So you got to keep an eye on investment costs. The fourth thing I said was. L- Look for ways to make more money. Again, this is sort of easy to sit behind a microphone and say this, but if I were in that situation, I'd be looking for ways to either make more money at my current work, whatever it was, or maybe looking for a, a, a second job or um, a way to make extra income. I mean, even if it's a few hundred dollars a month, all of which can go to investing, it's going to make a big difference when multiplied over 10, 15, or 20, 20 years. And, uh, you know, I know what it's like to work two jobs. That's effectively what I did when I started this blog uh, uh, way back when. Um, so, you know, I do know what it's like. I wasn't in a financial pinch when I did it, and so I didn't have that added stress. And that can certainly uh, weigh on folks. I understand that. But, uh, you know, if you're at that point, I think figuring out a way to make some extra money uh, is really critical. And that extra few hundred bucks a month you know, will go a long way to helping you fund uh, your retirement or, by the way, pay down debt if you're also struggling with uh, high interest uh, uh, debt. The fifth thing is that I said to my friend is, you know, you, you need to pre- be prepared to work longer. You know, I know this is sort of the opposite of the early retirement crowd. And, you know, if you're 50 and you follow the early retirement recipe exactly, you can retire at 65 uh, or 70 for sure. Uh, but you know, for a lot of folks that maybe can't save 60 or 70% of their gross income or just choose not to, you may need to be prepared to work longer. I think a lot of folks are working longer anyway. You know, the, 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 the traditional retirement age of 65, I don't think holds anymore. My mom is still a substitute teacher. She taught for many years. She's now in her seventies and she, she's a substitute teacher several times a week during the school year and loves it. And uh, so I don't think that's at all uncommon, but I think as you as you work through your retirement planning, I think you need to be prepared to work longer if you're able able to do so. The sixth and final thing I suggested to my friend was you need to get help. You know, talk to a financial planner. I would I would talk to someone on an hourly basis, get by an hour or two of their time. Uh, they can walk through the specifics of your circumstances. Maybe they can make some suggestions that you wouldn't have thought of on your own. The other thing they might be able to help you with is to prioritize your financial goals. You know, because you may have some debt you're dealing with, you know, obviously saving for retirement, uh, you, you know, you, you, perhaps a mortgage. Uh, and, and so, you know, you've got all of these, what, what it can be, you know, feel like competing financial goals tugging at you. And, you know, which ones should I deal with first? How should I prioritize it? That's always a, a, a tricky issue for folks, in part because there's oftentimes no clear, obvious answer. And I think a financial planner who can sit down with you would be a, a big help. Uh, so those are the things that I, I mentioned to my friend. But but the big takeaway is if you're in that situation, learn from the early retirement crowd. Find the folks that retired after 10 or 15 or 20 years of work and do what they did so that you're 50 now and you can retire at 65 or 70 by applying the very things that they did. So it's kind of, I find it interesting that all of these pieces can kind of work together, even though like Jeff, I'm sort of a financial freedom, big picture kind of thinker, I guess, uh, when it comes to solving some real practical personal finance issues like being 50 and, um, and, and, and and not being prepared with retirement, you can take something like early retirement crowd and you can learn from that 35-year-old or 40-year-old who's already retired. And maybe that can help you prepare for retirement when you're 65 or 70. Okay, so our third and final email for today actually comes from the opposite end. So we talked about someone who was 50 and still or just starting out uh, trying to plan for retirement. Now we've got an email from someone who's 18 and uh, wants to start investing. His name is Kyle. He wrote in, he said, Hello, my name is Kyle, and I've been looking into investing for the past few weeks. I'm only 18, but I work two jobs and have built us up a small savings account of less than $1,500, which is a lot to a college student working over a grill for $8 an hour. Anyway, I want to start working towards a strong financial future now, so after some research, I've opened an E-Trade account and am ready to invest around $600. 
I think I want to go with either an index fund or a mutual fund because I don't feel at all comfortable in the open seas of the stock market and keeping up with an ETF seems a little too complicated to start with. Now, that was sort of the beginning of his email. And then he asked me a series of questions. And I want to, I want to cover those. Before I do, just one clarification. One of the things that I think makes investing difficult when you're just starting out is all the terminology. There's a lot of just terms that you need to know. Once you know them, it becomes a lot you know, more clear, uh, but they can stump you at, at first. And one of the things he said, he talked about an index fund or a mutual fund. Let's talk about those terms for a moment, because an index fund is a type of mutual fund, right? All a mutual fund is, is an investment that it, it itself owns uh, a whole bunch of stocks, individual stocks, you know, or uh, stocks of individual companies, or bonds, or a combination of both, right? And mutual funds come in a lot of different flavors, and they have a lot of different investment objectives. So, for example, you could have a mutual fund that focuses on um, the, the, the health care, and all they invest in are healthcare companies, right? You can have a mutual fund that invests just in overseas companies, or it invests in bonds of low-grade uh, junk bonds of corporations, right? Or, or they invest in municipal bonds issued by look, you know, local governments and hospitals and universities and that that sort sort of thing. Uh, so you have all kinds of different mutual funds. Some of them are or what what folks call actively managed. And some of them are passively managed. And that would include an index fund is passive, passively managed. So what's that mean, active versus passive? Well, all active means is the folks that run the mutual fund, uh, they, they get together a bunch of smart people and they analyze companies, whether they're investing in stocks or bonds, and they try to pick the best investments based on their analysis. So, of course, as you think about that, they got to pay these smart people who came from Harvard and Stanford and uh, other places a lot of money to do all this analysis for them. But the goal is to to invest in companies that outperform the market. That's actively managed. Passively managed, example again, as I said, would be an index fund. What an index fund says is, let's forget analyzing all these companies and let's forget hiring a bunch of MBAs to do that. We're just going to mirror an index, say like the S&P 500. So we don't need people. To, there's no analysis that needs to be done. We just need a computer program to buy and sell the stocks of of the S and P five hundred to to mirror that that index. That's that's you know all we need to do, and uh, so index funds tend to be uh, uh, a lot cheaper. The, the the expense ratios of index funds tend to be a lot cheaper because they don't have to hire all of these people to analyze stocks and bonds like actively managed funds do. The other thing is particularly for U.S. stock funds, index funds on the long term tend to outperform. Uh, actively uh, managed funds. So that's one of the benefits of an index fund. Although there are plenty of good actively managed funds. And by the way, Vanguard, you know, sort of the king of index funds, they have a lot of actively managed funds too. Uh, so in any event, I just want to clarify that, that, you know, an index fund is a type of mutual fund. So with that, let's run through some of Kyle's questions. First one was, is right now the, is, is now the right time to invest with the market so low? That's question one. So two thoughts. One, I wouldn't say the market is low. I mean, it's certainly been down this year in early 2016, and I'm recording this podcast, let me check the date, on January 25th, uh, after having survived the blizzard of 2016 here in D.C. The market's down about 1.5% today. Oil crashed again, I think it was down 7%, you know, and it's been, the market's been down for the year. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it low. I certainly wouldn't call it undervalued. That being said, I get a lot of email about from folks saying, you know, I've got some money to invest. Should I do it now? Should I wait? I'm going to invest in an IRA. Should I just do it all now or should I spread it out over the year? My answer to that question is, I don't know. I have no idea what the market's going to do tomorrow. So my investment investment choices aren't based on what I think the market will do tomorrow. So in my case, I, you know, I invest now. If I have money to invest, it goes in now. I don't wait. Uh, and, and in fact, I just put in a, a bunch of money and it's part of a, uh, defined benefit plan. And I just invested it all at once, uh, because I have no idea what the market's going to do, uh, tomorrow, let alone, you know, next week, next month, next, you know, next year. And you hear all these folks in the financial press predict, well, I, you know, so-and-so predicts the Dow will be at X at the end of the year. I just think that's moronic. I mean, it really is. Uh, and it's certainly, you know, uh, silly, in my my opinion, to make investing decisions based on a prediction of what the market will do. I just don't, I just don't find it's 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 you can consistently succeed that way. 
So that's my response to that first question. I think it's a great question, though. And it's particularly as a young investor, it's something you're going to have to decide on your own. You, you may, you know, Kyle may disagree with me. He may think he can predict the market uh, because you know you've got to figure out where you stand on that. It's going to it's going to uh, determine in, in in many respects what kind of investor you become. Next question: Any thoughts or suggestions on my mutual fund or index fund line of thinking? Well. Um, I absolutely think mutual funds, including index funds, are a great way to invest, uh, particularly as you're just starting out. I absolutely agree that trying to evaluate individual stocks it can be a, it's a very time consuming. Uh, it's something that I do. I do invest in individual stocks as well, so I don't certainly don't dismiss that. Uh, but I think you know if, if if my son or daughter were coming to me and asking me, I, I would say stick to index funds investing to, to begin with. Um, absolutely. Uh, and I think it's a great low cost way to invest. And then he says, is it smart for me to not jump the gun and dump a thousand that I have right off the bat? Or is that, is that the better move? I think I've responded to that. Um, but then he goes on, this is an interesting question that I think a lot of first time investors, you know, struggle with. Do you know any funds that require a minimum that I can afford? So many I look at require uh, $2,500 and, um, yeah, that's true. And so I think with Vanguard, I think it's 3000 Fidelity might be a little less. Now, you could invest in an ETF. Uh, they don't have minimums. You do have a, tr- a transaction fee. What I suggest for young investors is Wealthfront or Betterment. Um, they will put your money in a series of low-cost index funds. They use ETFs, but that's neither here nor there as far as uh, the investor is concerned. You just you know, you know, submit, you deposit your money, and they take care of it. Uh, they will rebalance for you. They'll reinvest your dividends. And they also have websites that are very easy to use and I think go a long way to explaining uh, investing and your portfolio. So I think they're excellent options. And with I think with Wealthfront, I think it's $500 minimum. I think Betterment doesn't have one. Uh, I personally, I mean, I, I like them both. I tend to, to recommend Wealthfront uh, to folks that I help, but they're both great options. And I've had accounts at both. So that's what I would recommend. And I think, Kyle, if you start consistently saving and investing money, uh, whether it's Wealthfront Betterment or you save up and you just get an index fund at Vanguard, I think you're well on your way to financial freedom. And uh, you know, if you wanted to start at Vanguard, honestly, I would just pick an S&P 500 fund to start with. You know, I don't think, you know, even if you save up the 3000 that's not enough money to worry about you know, diversifying further into like an international fund uh, or something else. I mean, you could pick, they have a world fund there. You could pick that. Frankly, I think if you're starting out an S&P 500 fund is just fine. But again, if you pick something like Wealthfront or Betterment, they're going to diversify you immediately. U.S. stocks, international stocks, uh, REITs if you're at Wealthfront, um, uh, bonds, depending on your allocation, which you get to pick. And so that's, that's I think, a great way to start. His final question that I want to address is any books that I think, you know, he ought to read. And I think there are, yeah, of course, some great books for beginners. Um, the one that I would start with, and I'm actually looking it up uh, on, on Amazon so that I know I get it right. Yeah. The Little Book of Common Sense Investing, The Only Way to Guarantee Your Fair Share of Stock Market Returns. Very easy book to read. It's written by John Bogle, the founder of, of Vanguard. And um, I, that's where I would start. I think that's a great, uh, another book that I like actually uh, from a group named after John Bogle, The Bogleheads, Guide to Investing. Uh, that's another good book. And I also like the one by my good friend, Rick Ferry, all about asset allocation. That's maybe a little more, they probably go in an order of sophistication, if you will. I'd start with the, the little book of Common Sense Investing, The Bogleheads, Guide to Investing. Rick Ferry's book is a very easy read, but you'd probably it'd probably be a little more approachable after you'd read the other two, but those are three great books um, to get you started. There, there are of course many, many others. Four Pillars of Investing is a great one. I mean, you know, uh, it, it goes on and on. There are a lot of great books, but that would certainly, I think, give you a good solid foundation. And I got to tell you, I love receiving emails from folks like Kyle, 18, starting to invest. Um, it, it is, it's, it's the, it's the easiest way to financial freedom. If we had all started when we were 18, I mean, the biggest, you know, you think about how much you save, your after fee, after tax returns, and then time. Time, that's a powerful element to compound interest. Again, if you're 50 and you're just starting, you are where you are. You, 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 can't, you can't reverse time, uh, although you can start today so that you don't find yourself at 55 or 60 with still nothing invested. But if you're 18 
or 20, you know, or, 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 or in your 20s, uh, fairly young, and you're just starting out, that's the perfect time to invest. That's why I cringe, by the way, when financial gurus say you should pay off all your non-mortgage debt before you, you start investing, even if you got 150000 in student loans and it'll take you 10 or 15 years. Oh, horrible advice. Absolutely horrible advice. Anyway, Kyle, thanks so much for the email, and I wish you uh, the best. And uh, so there you go. So from Jeff's financial freedom to my friend at 50 who's kind of just starting out to Kyle at 18 who's also just starting out, but obviously very different circumstances. Uh, hopefully, so my thoughts on their emails will be helpful to you. Love to hear from you, drdorler.net. Even better, join our Facebook group, dorler.net slash Facebook group, and you can leave your questions there. A lot of uh, great folks are already part of that Facebook group. And when folks ask questions, you know, they jump right in with some great answers and resources. And uh, that's uh, very much appreciated. Well, there you go. Hope you have a great week. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.